Okay, so in, in 2011, the Department of Environmental Affairs requested the South African National Biodiversity Institute to assist them with revising and updating the list of threatened or protected species. So those are the species that are listed in terms of Section 56 of the National Environmental Management Biodiversity Act of 2004, otherwise known as NEMBA, in one of four categories, including critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, and protected. This legislation provides protection for species that are listed in that a set of restricted activities in, in accordance with Section 57 of the Act may not be undertaken without a permit. These activities can also be prohibited by the Minister if required. The Act also specifies that the list must be reviewed at least every five years. So since I was the coordinator of the scientific authority, Sandy tasked me to coordinate this project. So part of the terms of reference that I received from the Department of Environmental Affairs was that all of our game species should be listed in the protected category. This particular part of the um, terms of reference really puzzled me because when I looked at the status of our game species in South Africa, with some exceptions, most of these species were listed in the IUCN red list category of least concern. So this table here shows the red list status of game species that are currently regulated in six or more provinces across South Africa. This, um, these um, statuses are actually the current outcome of the red listing mammal project, which is, is being coordinated by the Endangered Wildlife Trust. It's a collaborative partnership between EWT, SAMBI, the Department of Environmental Affairs and the Universities of Pretoria and Cape Town. Okay, so I was left with the question, why would we want to spend our limited conservation resources on regulating what to me are, well, to the IUC and are, are very common species when there are a range of other species that are in, in desperate need of our attention? For example, the pangolin, a vulnerable species that is in high demand in the traditional medicine trade. How about the bearded vulture? It's critically endangered and killed for use in traditional medicine. The sun gazer lizard, vulnerable, threatened by, again, used for traditional medicine and also pop very popular in the international pet trade. So I could have also put a, a slide up here on, on cycads, but I decided that I wouldn't because I thought maybe I should give one presentation finally where I actually don't mention the cycad extinction crisis. <laughs> and of course, that is driven by the wide scale perching across the country of our wild cycads. Then another issue that was raised during the consultation process that I held with um, a lot of conservation practitioners around the country was the issue around habitat loss. How do we protect species threatened by habitat loss? And there was a lot of pressure on, on us to list all of these species as threatened or protected. However, um, based, oh, first of all, when we looked at the restricted activities in terms of um, the Biodiversity Act, this is a, the list of them. And as you can see, they all relate to direct extractive use of species. So hunting, gathering, picking, importing, exporting, possessing, growing, conveying, selling, trading, etc. None of these activities actually relate to um, activities that people would do in destroying habitat. So it's clear that the legislation was not designed to deal with habitat loss, but rather direct extractive use. However, I also had a lot of experience, which I brought um, as a biodiversity planner from the Gauteng Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Environment. And, as I, and I was aware that there was a whole suite of in legislation, legislative tools that could be used to protect species from habitat loss. So for example, the Protected Areas Act. 
the environmental assessment regulations. These regulations designate sensitive geographical areas within which the destruction of indigenous vegetation may not take place unless a basic assessment is conducted and environmental authorization is given by the relevant authority. Section 40 of the Biodiversity Act also provides for the gazetting of bioregional plans. These bioregional plans are based usually on provincial systematic plans. Um, and all municipal plans, such as SDFs, IDPs, housing schemes, etc., must take into account bioregional plans. Then Section 52 of the Act allows for threatened ecosystems to be published. And at least two of the criteria for deciding which ecosystems should be listed in the Act deal explicitly with species threatened by habitat loss. So in my mind, there were several strategic reasons for not using TOPS to deal with species threatened by habitat loss. As mentioned before, in the slide before, there are several spatial legislative tools that can be used. We also want to avoid dilution of the TOPS lists. This is the only national legislation which we can use to deal with species that are at a high risk of unsustainable use. It also would be highly impractical to list all these species on TOPS. For example, there are over 3,100 plant species alone that are threatened by habitat loss. Imagine giving that book of species to our law enforcement officers to go and deal with. So at the outset of the consultation with the conservation practitioners, we decided that we would um, list a set of principles um, which we'd, we would establish and before we decide which species should go on onto the um, TOPS regulations. Firstly, species should be listed in accordance with their current IUCN red listings. We also thought it was very important that regulation of restricted activi activities must actually benefit the conservation of wild populations. Otherwise, why would we be spending precious conservation resources in regulating those activities? Also, stri stricter regulation should apply to species with higher risks of extinction. And we also thought it was important not to duplicate legislation. So where species were adequately protected by other legislation, we should not list them on tops. The example um, here would be species listed on the Marine Living Resources Act. Then again, we've got limited resources in South Africa for conservation. So resource inputs must be justifiable and practical in relation to the conservation benefits. And finally, very importantly, all species listings must be scientifically defensible. So we came up with a set of criteria for listing species, and they're very simple. Species that are critically endangered and threatened by direct use should be placed in the critically endangered category. Endangered species threatened by direct use in the endangered category. Vulnerable species in the vulnerable category and near threatened species in the protected category. We also thought that a separate criterion from the for the protected category was necessary to catch those least concern or data deficient species that are currently utilized in, at such high levels that we would need to manage and regulate them to avoid them becoming threatened. Then we couldn't get rid of the habitat loss issue because a lot of the practitioners felt that the EIA regulations were not catching those very very threatened species. So critically endangered species that may be confined to a single population or in a small area with only a few or like a hundred, a couple of hundred individuals would fall through the, that, that filter of the EIA regulations. So we proposed to the department that we should um, specify an additional restricted activity dealing with habitat loss and list those species in the critically endangered category. So the list was then taken through the first uh, for, through a public consultation phase, and um, the legal services department um, division in the department of environmental affairs did not like that additional criterion. They they said it was um, we should not uh, the legislation was not designed to deal with habitat loss, and they they strongly re recommended that those species be removed from the critically endangered category. But they've instructed Sandby to please um, um, coordinate a process to map these species, find out exactly where they occur, 
and they will advise on which other legislation would be most suitable for protecting those species. They'll probably use the Protected Areas Act um, and, and designate these areas and prohibit activities that are related to habitat loss. So I think that's a very positive outcome. Then finally, what to do about the game species. So for this issue, I approached the scientific authority and they decided that there were at least 20 game species that need to be regulated for one of those three reasons. We have issues around hybridization of closely related subspecies and species. We also have issues of mixing of ecotypes and also extra limited movement of, of species that are known to cause habitat degradation outside of their natural ranges. So the 20 species they came up with are listed in this table here. And the marks um, on the table indicate the rationales for listing those species in the protected categories. So this was a, taken through the public consultation phase. And I think the department must have re received about 200 pages of comments. And most of them were aimed at these species, especially from the game farming industry. So a lot of objections and um, comments on these species. So we thought we better really do our homework on these. Um, and what we did is we looked for scientific evidence in the literature for the rationales that we'd, we'd, um, dis uh, we'd proposed these species would be listed upon. So this table shows the result of that. Where I've indicated no, it indicates that there's no scientific evidence that those threats are um, operating for those species. Where, there, where yes indicates obviously that there is scientific evidence. So in the spirit of ensuring that all of our species are scientifically defensible, we decided that we needed to remove all the species and rationales which were not supported by any scientific evidence. And we were left with this list. Then the next step, in discussion with the Department of Environmental Affairs, we decided that the alien invasive species regulations should rather deal with the hybrid issue where one of the species was an exotic species. So those species were removed. And finally, with re regards to the issue around habitat, habitat degradation, we thought that this was a, a more a management issue and should not be regulated in legislation. And so those species were removed and we were left with these nine species here. Most of the issues that we did, well, the, the predominant issue is hybridization. So we also recommended that these species should receive only limited regulation. So instead of regulating all that huge list of restricted activities, we suggested that all of these restricted activities should be exempted, except for keeping on the same property with other species or subspecies where hybridization is a possibility. And we suggested that this, this activity should actually be prohibited. Then there was an issue around intensive breeding and selective breeding. And um, speaking to um, a lot of conservation geneticists, we um, came to the understanding that intensive breeding is only a real threat to a species if the population is small. So those species with small populations in South Africa, we've recommended to the department should be regulated in terms of keeping in a controlled environment. So that's um, the game species. So altogether, 271 taxa are threatened by direct use or subjected to, to potentially unsustainable harvest levels and have been proposed for the tops lists. You can see that the bulk of the species are plants at 172 taxa. Then we've got 22 birds proposed, seven fish, 24 invertebrates, 30 mammals and 16 reptiles. It's a very useful exercise to then look at the direct use activities are, that are threatening these proposed top species. So if we look at the plants, for example, we can see that the major um, activities that are threatening these species include horticultural collections and harvesting for traditional medicinal use. So if we want to spend our conservation resources wisely, we need to focus our conservation interventions in dealing with these impacts. Similarly, harvesting for traditional or medicinal use comes up again as an issue for reptiles. 
but also for reptiles we are concerned about the collection for the pet trade. Again, harvesting for traditional or medicinal use and collection for pets are, um, must be addressed for birds, but also persecution comes here as an issue that we need a conservation intervention for. For mammals, again, traditional medicinal use and um, persecution, but we've also got issues around hunting and hybridization. The invertebrates are quite simple. There are people out there that for some reason need to have an example of whatever beetle species in their collection so they can look at it. And they also seem to want these invertebrates as pets. So that's, we're basically dealing with those kind of activities for invertebrates. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the conservation practitioners that assisted Sambi with this project. Uh, their input was extremely valuable. Um, and just to let you know that the department is about to publish a, the, the next list again for public comment. They received so many comments the first time round. There have been substantial changes to the list that was first proposed. So they will be publishing it again. And I'd like to encourage all of you to, to look at that and think about it and provide your input to improve, to make this list really good. Okay. Thanks.